The movie begins with a pretty blue moon up in the sky. Under the sparkling sky is an enchanting ballroom, a time-worn relic reminiscent of a bygone era, the 1900s. Inside the ballroom, dressed in a beautiful ball gown, is Savannah. A narrator narrates her story of finding the blue moon and her true love, Lyndon, on the same night. Savannah ventures outside, and Lyndon, smitten, follows her beneath a tapestry of twinkling stars. Under the celestial canopy, they share a passionate kiss. As Savannah runs off into the wilderness, the narrator closes the storybook, the echoes of their love lingering in the air. The narrator is Danny, a literary agent, who is reading the book written by our protagonist, Grace Montague. Grace is a successful novel writer, but since her book sales have dropped significantly, she only has 10 more days to finish the third and final book in her trilogy. Danny warns her that if this book isn't successful, they will sadly have to end her contract. Grace's sigh speaks volumes, her creative wellspring is devoid of the elixir of love. Nevertheless, she pledges to deliver the finished manuscript within days, a vow fueled by determination rather than inspiration. He then advises her to go on a date with her long-lost boyfriend Sean to spark the old love inside her, but she snaps at him as a reminder of the severed ties between her and Sean. But he still tells her to go back to the point when she first fell in love, and write from that memory, so that it could reignite her reader's fervor for her work, ensuring her legacy endures through the passage of a decade. Later, Grace finds herself in the quiet solitude of a bookstore, eagerly awaiting a meet and greet with her readers, only to be met by the disheartening emptiness of the room. Grace sits at her table, disappointed, but that is when James, a doctor, accidentally bumps into her books, scattering them everywhere. As he raises his gaze to meet her, his breath is momentarily stolen by her enchanting beauty, and to make up for his mistake, he buys one of her books. In a bold move, he extends an invitation for brunch, his heart skipping a beat at the mere thought of spending more time in her presence. She smiles, signs his book, and writes her name and number on it. After he leaves, the store owner Esther compliments that he is really handsome, thinking Grace will enjoy her time with him. Grace just smiles, and with her books carefully packed away in a box, expresses her gratitude to Esther for the opportunity to use the bookstore. Grace's journey takes her soaring back to her hometown, and is welcomed by her very excited mom, Judith. She says that Grace is right on time for the Blue Moon Ball. At the confusion in her expression, her mom informs her that it has been five years since she last set foot in the city. Grace, caught between the tendrils of nostalgia and the currents of time, can only shake her head in a bewildered state. After talking for more than an hour, Grace retreats to the sanctuary of her childhood room, a cocoon of memories and emotions. With a photograph of herself and Sean clasped tenderly in her hands, she settles into slumber, her heart carrying the weight of years gone by, and the hope of a future yet to unfold. As the first rays of the new day's sun ascend, Grace dresses up in a way to conceal her identity from people, and goes down to the old mansion to write. Just when she sits on the bench, just outside the mansion, a girl bumps into her. Heather, an old school friend of Grace, enfolds her in a heartfelt hug, her face illuminated by the sheer joy of reunion. Grace expresses that she is happy to be back in time for the ball, but Heather drops the bombshell that the cherished mansion, the very cornerstone of the forthcoming Blue Moon Ball, teeters on the brink of obliteration, destined to be replaced by the sterile grandeur of a new shopping complex. Grace's shock reverberates through her, but Heather, oblivious to the turmoil within Grace, continues to recount tales of her own life, reveling in the trappings of wealth and her romantic conquests. As Heather leaves, Grace picks up her stuff and goes to a centuries-old tree nearby to sit down, determined to craft a story that transcends time and memory. As she begins, a new character emerges from the other side of the tree, Sean, Grace's first love. She is shocked to see him at their tree, the same spot where they spent countless hours together. A surge of shock courses through Grace as she beholds him, and a flood of memories comes crashing back like waves against the shore. Sean reveals that he's returned to their hometown during a work break, since he is an architect, and got his first proper job back in his hometown. Grace scoffs, thinking that he is here to pull down the mansion. But when he corrects her that he is there to deem the place historic and to save it, a swell of joy and gratitude erupts within Grace, and she envelops him in a tight, awkward hug. Grace confides in Sean, admitting that she was hurt when Heather told her about the demolition of the mansion. He looks a bit shocked at hearing Heather's name, but doesn't show it, and simply says that he is glad to run into her. He then leaves, explaining that he's obligated to return to work, tasked with crafting a weighty proposal to safeguard the future of the beloved Blue Moon Ball. After the amazing yet awkward encounter, Danny calls her and summons her immediately to his office. But since she is back home, Danny issues his ultimatum, instructing her to deliver the pages for her book by Friday, before abruptly severing the connection. Sean comes back home to his girlfriend, who is none other than Heather, and asks her about her day. Absorbed in her own narrative, launches into a detailed account of her writing club adventures, but overlooks the simple courtesy of asking about Sean's day. Perceiving the change in Sean's demeanor, Heather gently probes for the source of his disquiet. Sean, struggling to contain his frustration, broaches the topic that has been gnawing at him. He finds it disconcerting that Heather seems so cavalier about the impending shopping complex, forgetting that his job is to safeguard the historic mansion. 
She just laughs it off, saying that it's his first job, and her dad will be really happy when Sean declares this place a waste of space. He gets angry, saying that the mansion means a lot to him. But she contends that one should not overlook the fact that the mansion is a financial black hole, and that the shopping mall will increase their economy by 10%. Annoyed, he asks why she doesn't live in her own place. Her response is tinged with amusement as she playfully asserts that she is the sole reason their shared dwelling has any semblance of livability. On the other side, Grace comes back home and finds her godfather, the town's sheriff Carson, standing in the kitchen, prompting an immediate and heartfelt embrace, a warm reunion with the cherished guardian. At the dining table, as she sets up the dishes, she asks them about demolishing the old mansion. Carson responds by saying that it is a tragedy, but they don't have any control over it. She mentions Sean's efforts to save the place, but Carson acknowledges that even though the town is lucky to have Sean, he is not a persuasive person. In the quiet confines of her room, Grace turns to her ever-reliable phone, seeking answers to the enigma of love that has long eluded her. Just as she begins her digital quest for insight, her phone springs to life, the ringtone announcing an incoming call. She answers the call, finding James on the other side. He asks her out for brunch, but she apologizes, since she isn't in Los Angeles. Before the call ends, she asks him how he knows when to stop diagnosing a patient, a query that transcends the medical realm, seeking broader wisdom. He just laughs and tells her to follow her gut. Finding the answer to her unsaid question, she says goodbye and ends the call. Immediately after, she once again asks her phone, but this time, about how to write a persuasive study on a historical property value, and get straight to work. Next morning at 5, Grace bursts into her mother's room with unbridled excitement, eager to share her breakthrough. She announces that she has discovered a way to assist Sean. Judith appreciates her, but concern laces her voice when she says that it isn't a good idea to work with Sean, because when they broke up, Grace was hurt. Grace reassures her mother that the wounds of the past have long since healed. She's resolute in her determination to help Sean. As the sun ascends higher in the sky, Grace embarks on a poignant pilgrimage to the old mansion. Within its time-worn walls, she encounters Sean. He confesses that he was hired for the job because the contractor knew that he was going to fail, the contractor being Heather's dad. Grace sighs and says that she grew up listening to the stories that her ancestors built this place. Sean is shocked because he grew up listening to the exact same stories. Their synchronicity sparks a wistful smile as she suggests the possibility that their ancestors had a hand in building this place together, casting their legacy as a joint responsibility to salvage it. Later, Sean decides to head home to grab some tools, but when Grace asks to tag along, he stumbles for an excuse, citing a fictitious mice infestation problem at his new place. However, the distraction fades as Grace spots the familiar sight of the car he used to drive years ago, a relic from their shared past. Sean drops Grace at her mom's place, where she seeks guidance and help regarding Sean. Grace confides in her mother about her complicated feelings regarding him. Judith, with a slight smile gracing her lips, asks Grace if she is still in love with Sean. When Grace hesitates in forming a proper reply, Judith advises her to start writing to sort out her emotions, just like she did the first time. With gratitude, Grace accepts her mother's wisdom, sharing a meaningful moment before retreating to her room. She then picks up a pen and a journal, and starts scribbling. On the flip side of the narrative, Sean's return to the old mansion yields an unexpected discovery, a hidden door. He calls Grace and asks her to get there immediately. With Grace by his side, Sean musters the courage to open the secret door, revealing a wooden wall adorned with a tapestry of names etched into its surface. She concludes that it might be the names of old lovers, and they drive to his grandfather's house to confirm her theory. On their drive, he promises to save the mansion, and not disappoint her like he did in the past. Grace's simmering frustration erupts, her words piercing through the air like shards of regret. She confronts him about the countless messages left unanswered, a stark reminder of the emotional chasm that once divided them. Seeing her rising temper, he apologizes for screwing up everything they had. She cuts the engine, and with sad eyes asks if it's too late to fix things. But before he can answer, he sees Heather jogging in their direction, so he pushes Grace down, hiding her face, while saying that he is trying to get a bug out of her hair. When the threat of Heather seeing him with Grace passes, he releases her and goes out to throw away the imaginary bug. While he is gone, she finds old photos of them in his car, and that evokes a bittersweet smile, a reminder of the emotions and memories they once shared. Heather gets to Judith's place and hands her a survey, to know what kind of shops the people want in the new mall. But Judith very politely refuses to fill in the form, since she and Grace both are completely against the demolition of the mansion. Heather smiles, respecting Judith's decision, and says that Grace is lucky to have such a supportive parent. Sean goes and gets his grandfather, Albert, and introduces him to Grace. The elderly gentleman, seemingly caught in the labyrinth of time, affectionately addresses her as Marguerite, inviting her to join him for a ride. Sean attempts to correct this misidentification, but Grace, sensing the importance of the moment, plays along with Albert's charming confusion. Before getting into the car, Albert's gaze lingers on Grace, and he humorously refers to her as a taxi driver, requesting a ride to the old mansion. 
At the mansion, Sean asks Albert about the blue moon ball. Albert laughs, and with tears in his eyes, says that dancing under the blue moon is how every man in their town found the love of his life. Grace inquires if this is how Albert met Marguerite, but he shares that their love story unfolded differently, as they grew up together, much like Sean and Grace. Her curiosity piqued, she probes further about the carved initials, and Albert unveils the profound legend behind them. These aren't mere initials, but a venerable tradition dating back to the blue moon itself. The legend foretells that carving one's name next to their beloveds ensures their reunion beneath the next blue moon. A few moments later, Albert questions why he is being asked about the blue moon ball, and when they tell him about the shopping mall project, he gets furious and starts marching towards the study room. Not having any information about this room, Sean and Grace follow after him. He leads them to a secret door, they find the original map of their town, and Albert says that this is where the founder of the town, Hastings, envisioned this place. Grace's excitement bubbles to the surface, contemplating the possibility of declaring the mansion a historical landmark. Sean emphasizes that this hinges on the discovery of the mansion's original paperwork. Albert lastly shows them the desk filled with all the paperwork Hastings created. Later, before Grace leaves, Sean asks her for some advice which his friend needs. She encourages him, and he starts telling his friend's story, which in reality is his own story, of how he has a girlfriend who he wants to break up with, but he has also found his long-lost love. He then asks what his friend should do, and she smiles and says that he should be honest with the girl he loves. Grace gets home and her mom feeds her cookies. Later, they sit under the starry sky, discussing how the blue moon ball is the best thing ever. Grace suggests that instead of tearing down the mansion, they could convert it into a farmer's market or a wedding venue to help boost the town's economy. Right then, they see a shooting star, and Judith wishes for the mansion to be saved. Grace wishes for a sign that if Sean is the one, he should call her right now. Her phone starts ringing, and she jumps up, thinking that her wish has been granted, but finds Danny written on it. Her disappointment is palpable, but her mother offers a soothing perspective, reminding her that a lack of immediate signs doesn't necessarily foretell the future's uncertainties. Grace, though wearing a smile tinged with sadness, clings to the profound hope that her mother's words will indeed ring true. Meanwhile, Heather gets home and finds Sean passed out on the sofa. In a gesture of tenderness, she drapes a blanket over him, a silent acknowledgement of their complex connection. Right before leaving, she spots his work file and picks it up. Shuffling through the pages, she sees that he is up to something and calls her dad. With concern etching her voice, she apprises her father of Sean's possession of potentially incriminating evidence. She implores him to act, aware of the looming threat it poses to their mall project. Her father, bristling with irritation, redirects the burden onto Heather, suggesting that if she desires to become the executive developer of the mall, it falls upon her to sway Sean's decision. Next morning, Grace is ready to leave the house all dressed up. Judith playfully teases her, insinuating that her attire is meant for Sean. Grace sighs and says that she can't finish her book unless she finds out how her own love story ends. At his apartment, Sean wakes up and dials Heather's number, but it goes straight to voicemail. He contemplates hanging up, but decides on leaving a message. He urges her that they need to talk today. As he concludes, a familiar tune drifts into his ears, drawing him toward its source. He follows the haunting melody, ultimately arriving at the old mansion, and finds Grace waiting for him. She smiles and he remarks on his ability to recognize their song from a considerable distance. Intrigued, Grace inquires about his delay in arriving, prompting Sean to explain that he needed to attend to another matter so he could devote his full attention to her. Emotions swirl between them, their reunion fraught with unspoken significance. She then hands him the finished proposal, along with the idea of a farmer's market and wedding venue. Overwhelmed by her thoughtfulness, Sean tenderly kisses the proposal, and they succumb to the entrancing rhythm of the music, their bodies swaying to an intimate dance. While dancing, Grace bravely declares her desire for something beyond friendship, catching Sean off guard. As they lean in for a long-awaited kiss, the world seems to melt away, leaving only the promise of their connection. However, right before their lips collide, they hear Heather's screams from outside. Rushing to investigate, they discover Heather sprawled on the ground, writhing in pain. Turns out, after getting his voicemail, she was hurrying towards the mansion when she fell down. Sean helps her stand up, while Grace goes to fetch the car to take her to the hospital. Left alone, Heather envelops Sean in a grateful embrace, expressing her luck in having him in her life, someone who will choose her over an old building. Curiosity gnaws at her, and she probes Sean about the purpose of the crucial conversation he wished to have earlier. Sean, opting for evasion, dismisses it as unimportant. When they reach the hospital, Sean steps out to retrieve a wheelchair, firmly instructing the girls not to converse in his absence. Not taking his order into any consideration, they begin discussing his good manners and contagious laugh. Heather compliments that Grace did an amazing job in capturing Sean's character in her novels. Before their conversation can deepen, Sean returns, the tension palpable. Turns out the doctor that will be helping Heather is none other than James. He is surprised to see Grace there, but before they can say anything, Sean asks how they know each other. This intense conversation is disturbed by Heather, who demands to be examined. 
As James and Heather depart, James offers Grace a ride home, an offer she accepts, though Sean's unease is evident. Returning home, Grace rushes to her room, her heart filled with newfound certainty about her novel's ending. She confides in her mother, proclaiming that she's unraveled the narrative's ultimate destination, because she knows without a shadow of a doubt that Sean is the one who holds her heart. With inspiration overflowing, she gets to work with a huge smile etched on her face. With diligence and passion, she completes her manuscript and promptly dispatches it to Danny, her heart brimming with satisfaction. Meanwhile, Sean arrives home, escorting Heather, whose leg is fractured, and kindly offers her tea. But Heather being Heather, says that she needs the permit for the old mansion's demolition. He sighs, revealing that he knows that she is planning to be the lead developer of the mall, and claims that she should use her money for better purposes. When she scoffs, he gets up to make tea. The day before the most awaited blue moon ball arrives, Grace takes the stuff to the old mansion, while her mom informs her that the decorating crew will be there soon. Arriving at the mansion, she encounters Albert, his anger palpable after reading a newspaper article describing the mansion as a safety hazard due to a young woman's accident on its steps. Sensing his increasing anger, she calls Sean and asks him to get there as soon as possible. She then sees the contractors digging holes around the mansion for the explosives. She pleads with them to cease their work, but they retort that they're all battling for something, and that if they don't dig, someone else surely will. Sean arrives to take Albert back home, but the elderly man wishes to take a final look at the place. Once inside the mansion, they discuss the ball, and that is when a postman arrives and hands Sean his mail. They finally rip it open, and find the permit to keep the mansion inside it. She squeals in excitement and starts to leave, to tell everyone that the ball is going to happen, and no one is going to demolish the mansion. Right before leaving, she tells him that she will be at his place at 7pm tonight. Sean drives back home, but before entering, he sits inside his car and practices how he is going to break up with Heather. She is inside dancing, but when she hears him come, she slips on her fake cast and lies down, pretending to have a fractured leg. Sean arrives with the permit in his hand, and tells her that they need to break up. She nods her agreement and asks him to leave. He goes, allowing her to have some time to grieve, but as soon as he leaves, she gets up and starts reading the permit. Realizing that he left the permit back in the room with her, he turns around and finds Heather standing and going through it. Realizations dawn on him that she was acting about the broken leg, just so that the mansion could be demolished. Back at her home, Grace is talking about Heather with her mom when she gets a call from Danny. He asks her to come to his office the next morning to discuss her novel, and she agrees. After the call, she gets up to go meet Sean. At Sean's home, a profound conversation unfolds between him and Heather. She confesses to fabricating many aspects of their relationship, revealing her desire to prove herself to her family, even if it meant resorting to deceit. But with the mansion staying in its place, her dreams have gone down the gutter. She thanks him for understanding her, and leans in to hug him. He hugs her back, but when he opens his eyes, he sees Grace looking at them with disappointment and hurt on her face. Believing she has been betrayed, Grace withdraws, her heart heavy with anguish, and departs from the scene. Back home, Grace tells her mom that she was living in a fantasy, and is leaving for Los Angeles. She deletes Sean's number, not wanting anything to do with him. On the other hand, he keeps trying to call her, but she never picks up. As Grace embarks on her journey to the airport, Sean arrives at her doorstep, only to be met with the news of her departure. Judith leaves him outside. He sits down on the steps, thinking that he has lost his chance with Grace, but that is when he finds one of Grace's red heels. He knocks on the door and tells Judith that he has the most wonderful plan to bring her back. The following day in Danny's office, he delivers a critique of Grace's novel, emphasizing the absence of emotional resolution between the main characters. He hands her the check, saying that they don't need the third book of the trilogy, because sometimes an open ending is better than a wrong one. Disappointed, she goes back to her apartment and starts crying. A persistent doorbell rings, and to her annoyance, she discovers her damaged red heel on the doorstep. There is a knock on the door once again, and this time she finds a box filled with letters. She picks up one of them, begins reading, and finds that all of these are the letters Sean wrote but never sent her. She crumples it up and throws it away. However, the third knock brings her face to face with Sean, who dons an unconventional outfit. He arrives with a singular purpose, to win her back, offering her the opportunity to inquire about anything that lingers unresolved. She finally asks everything that was bottled inside her, fostering a candid conversation that dispels their misunderstandings and offers the prospect of reconciliation. They both get on a plane and arrive back home, right in time for the blue moon ball. They dance under the moon, and even carve their initials on the wooden wall as a testament to their love. In the midst of the twirls and laughter, Grace discloses the loss of her publishing contract, her dreams momentarily dimmed, but he tells her not to lose hope, because he knows someone who will invest in her books. Together, they approach Heather, and in a twist of fate, she agrees to collaborate with Grace, breathing life back into her writing aspirations. As the night deepens, Grace extends an invitation for Sean to join her in Los Angeles, understanding that her heart is torn between the allure of her hometown, 
and the promise of a broader world. Sean, seeking solitude to ponder his decision, steps away, leaving their future hanging in the balance. Months pass, and Grace's determination yields the publication of her final book. The bookstore buzzes with eager readers seeking signed copies of her work. When asked about her muse, a wistful smile plays on Grace's lips as she reveals his absence. Yet, in a serendipitous moment, Sean arrives, apologizing for his tardiness. The movie ends with their reunion, as it sets the stage for a harmonious conclusion, as their lips meet, bringing their journey to a poignant end.